a typhoon in the Philippines, flooding in India and Bangladesh. Disasters such as these have always faced mankind, and there is not much we can do about them. But now it seems likely that some of these climatic problems are being made worse by the effect man has had on the planet's atmosphere. Global warming is already affecting the climate and, if not checked, could mean that in 40 years' time, large areas of the Earth's surface will change dramatically. Our children's world could look very different to the one we know now. The so-called greenhouse gases and other emissions that are affecting the climate come from many sources, including the world's merchant fleets. It is, of course, very easy to talk grandly of the big problem, a problem that faces mankind and perhaps more difficult when trying to relate that problem to each and every one of us as individuals. But the situation is not yet lost. We can take effective action to prevent some of the damage we are doing to the environment. We need to ask, what can I do to help the situation? Will anything I do, any action I take, really make a difference? The answer to both these questions is, Yes, the harmful trend can certainly be slowed and may be in time reversed. This program, whilst looking at the global issues, will also reveal how the actions of those who live and work on the oceans can play a significant role in correcting the current imbalance. The practical measures that seafarers take to avoid unnecessary waste and reduce the energy that's consumed on board will have a positive effect, not only on their local environment, but for the greater good of their fellow man. A ship is a very large object, and to move it around the sea uses a lot of energy, generally produced by burning oil. You only have to look at the number of ships at sea at any one time to grasp the scale of oil consumption. In the region of 150 million tons per year, burning this quantity of fuel produces large volumes of greenhouse gases, which all contribute to global warming. A report presented recently to the International Maritime Organization in the context of environmental issues compared the energy consumption and emission levels for various forms of transport. It confirmed that seaborne transportation was energy efficient compared with other modes of transport and should be strongly promoted as such. While some emissions such as SOx and NOx are higher than those of other means of transport, shipping continues to have a fundamental role in the development of environmentally sustainable transportation systems. In other words, shipping as a global method of freight movement is here to stay. Nevertheless, every effort is required to reverse the continuing increase in energy consumption and shipping must play its part in this. The report also declared that emissions are greatest relatively near shore in the northern hemisphere, in northern Europe, along both east and west coasts of the United States and in the North Pacific. This is due to the higher volume of traffic in these waters. The document went on to state that a rise in the demand for shipping services worldwide would mean a general increase in emissions. In addition, Customers were demanding higher speeds and greater availability, which would also increase consumption. So, assuming there is no major downturn in trade between Europe, America and the Far East, how can emissions be reduced? The first method by which emissions may be reduced lies in ship construction. New vessels will have ever more efficient hull design to allow for a smoother, less energy demanding flow through the water and be propelled by engines that have a greater fuel efficiency, emit less by way of pollutants 
into the atmosphere and are also more cost effective. Not only are designs of both hull and engine construction under review, but new materials are also constantly being developed and tested. In years to come, it's likely that lightweight alloys and carbon fibers will be more widely used in shipboard components. The hull coating and its condition also directly affect the smooth flow of water around the ship and propeller, and hence the consumption of fuel. The choice of the marine anti-fouling coating and its subsequent maintenance is therefore crucial to fuel efficiency. Despite these potential improvements, however, new high-speed vessels will inevitably use much more fuel per unit of freight delivered, as these figures make clear. All the more reason for energy consumption to be a concern on such vessels. Even though the latest generation of ships being built are cleaner and more fuel efficient, no amount of advanced design and technology can compensate for a poorly maintained and operated vessel. A ship may be 25 years old, but it can still be operated efficiently. This efficiency can come from the ship's owners or managers, and it can come from the master and crew. For optimum energy consumption, both parties must communicate clearly and be able to plan and liaise with each other on a regular basis. To everybody, we meet today to discuss and implement the policy of our company regarding the energy and fuel saving. A shipping company should have a clear energy saving plan, promoted in consultation with the crew. The performance should be monitored and the results fed back to crew members. Fleet-wide performance results monitored by the company's head office can also help motivate crews to take the subject seriously. Ideally, voyage planning should try to achieve an optimum level of fuel consumption by maintaining constant speeds and avoiding large or rapid course changes. Satellite navigation allows more accurate great circle routes to be used for long ocean voyages. But there can be problems. For example, while some ships are at sea, their cargo can be bought and sold several times over, and this may mean a change in its discharge port. For all ships, arrival time at a given destination can be governed by a number of factors. Weather, equipment failures, perhaps another vessel has been delayed, affecting the availability of the berth you are heading for. When this happens, rather than proceeding at high speed to the intended port, burning excess fuel, which will cause more pollution and an increase in costs to its owner, the ship should proceed at a more moderate pace. This ensures greater fuel efficiency and less pollution. Although charter party obligations must always be complied with. If a fleet is run in such a manner, benefits follow for both the ship and the environment. Just in time routing is an obvious sensible measure, an element that can be constantly updated and monitored thanks to today's navigational and communication systems. Routing should also take into account weather, making allowances for variations and fluctuating patterns. It may be more prudent to alter your vessel's course to avoid a severe storm or adverse weather condition, and weather routing services can help this. Modern communication and navigational systems mean that the position of the ship is known at all times. So better passage management can help you to achieve optimum fuel consumption and performance. Other factors the master and chief engineer should consider when on passage include checking combustion, dirty emissions could mean low quality fuel, an inefficient engine or poorly cleaned exhausts. Monitor this in the engine room and Check your fuel making sample tests. The quality of your fuel is vital. An incorrect fuel 
can actually destroy an engine. Maintain a constant RPM and gentle use of the rudder. A steady state operation is much more energy efficient. Ensure propeller pitch and rudder angle accurately follow the commands from the bridge. Maintain optimum trim and remember that most tankers naturally trim by the head when underway. Ensure there's only the minimum ballast required to meet safety requirements. And when you do approach your destination, try to plan your berthing, mooring and anchoring so as to avoid unnecessary use of winches, lowering and raising of the anchor and so on. Finally, when in port, try to reduce your time there by optimal cargo handling. For example, careful planning of cargo pump usage on tankers. If all these actions are carried out, your ship is likely to be efficiently run and fuel consumption will benefit accordingly. Everybody, today we meet together to discuss about uh, reduced consumption of energy and fuel. There are many other detailed activities overseen and monitored by the master and senior management team and carried out by the crew which will improve efficiency and help protect the environment. These include the running of diesel generators in the most efficient way, except in an emergency where immediate action is required. The chief engineer will decide if and when a second generator is necessary. The use of a second generator should be considered only in cases such as critical navigational conditions or in port when ships' cranes are used for cargo operations, when pumping cargo on tankers, or when reefer containers are loaded. Once such a situation ceases, the second generator should be shut down. On vessels equipped with a harbour generator, it should be put online in port when loading or while a vessel is idling. This practice will reduce fuel consumption and the running hours of the main generator. Lighting. A safe number of lights should be kept on during the night, but all deck and superstructure lights should be switched off during daytime. All empty cabins and accommodation store lights should be switched off at all times. Ships' offices and public toilet lights should be switched off when not in use. Emergency generator and CO2 rooms should be kept with minimum lighting just to ensure safe entrance. And during the daytime, crew members leaving their cabin for a day's work or watchkeeping should adopt the habit of switching off the lights and any other personal electrical equipment. Where appropriate, fit long-lasting, low-wattage lighting. The small refrigerators in the galley and pantries must be maintained at all times in a clean and ice-free condition. And the condition of rubber door seals should be checked frequently. The cook should also ensure that the oven and hob are switched off. The cook and steward should ensure that all lights in the galley and pantries are switched off before they retire for the night. Even on a cruise liner, the air conditioning system should be utilised in the most efficient way, though this may be extremely difficult where passengers are concerned. All accommodation doors should be kept closed when not in use. The air system should be turned to recirculation mode as long as satisfactory air quality can be maintained. If conditions allow, the system should be switched off. A similar approach should be adopted with accommodation supply and exhaust fans. And engine room supply and exhaust fans should be used according to specific needs. When in port, the use of engine room fans should be restricted to one if conditions allow. 
when in port in extremely cold areas, all engine room fans should be stopped where applicable so as to prevent the cooling down of the main engine. The chief engineer should also ensure that the funnel door which leads to the boat or bridge deck remains closed at all times. Of course, good combustion and an efficient engine should be ensured. The fuel system kept tight and if any leaks are discovered, they should be eliminated immediately. Fuel valves, air filters and air coolers should be cleaned and or replaced as required and in line with planned maintenance procedures and with the maker's requirements. The use of the oil-fired boiler should be kept to a minimum and at sea, the exhaust gas boiler should supply all steam requirements. When this is not possible, some non-essential consumers should be shut off. These are just some of the measures that can and should be taken to ensure that energy on board is saved. In so doing, the vessel will become more environmentally friendly as well as more operationally efficient. You shouldn't become intimidated by any grand philosophy involving the saving of the planet. Just remember the principle, think globally, act locally which means that all of us can play a part in protecting the environment. Most of these actions are little more than common sense, but they help bring together the sometimes differing interests of a variety of groups, ship owners, crew and the international maritime bodies 